Electrical Engineering, Computer Science, and Automatic Control Conference, or CCE, 2022. Well, please, the audience in the room, the audience in the room, and remote participants, participants, disable microphones, they can be uh, able in the question and answer section, if you want to do a query. Uh, let me introduce myself quickly. My name is Sia PhD, PhD in electric engineering by junior staff, professor in ASIME in PN, Mexico City. I will be the session chair of this round. Actually, in the all of the session. I thank the organization organizing committee for allowing me to lead this session. This session is very wonderful. Okay, now. Okay. I introduce the speaker, Tejas Javier Ramirez Javier Ramirez Guzman. Uh, he is from he is from the Centro de Investigación y Estudios Avanzados, Instituto Politécnico Nacional. Tex are performed your presentation in 15 minutes maximum. Please, we will notify you when you remind two minutes, uh, saying two minutes. Two minutes. At the final uh, of your presentation, we dedicate five minutes to questions and answers. Any questions, Tejar? Any questions, Tejar? No. No, it's okay. Okay, you can begin okay. with your presentation. You can begin with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to be here in this in this in this presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about a comparative study on cooling system antenna versus non-cooling system antenna in multi-layer phantoms using low treatment powers. Mm. In this presentation, we will divide the presentation in a brief introduction about the microwave ablation, the materials and methods used in the experimental configuration, the results as well as the conclusions. Uh, as introduction, I want to start with the definition of the microwave ablation. So, microwave ablation is a technique in which have been recently studied to treat different kinds of tumor. In this case, uh, bone tumors. In this, in this technique, we use an antenna that is uh, inserted inside the tumor, and this antenna applies a electromagnetic energy with the objective to generate an ablation area with the name of uh, kill all the all the all the tumor in this case. But uh, one of the principal uh, uh, case that, that we want to, to produce in the tumor is the increase in the temperature. For that, we need temperatures between 60 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius to kill all the all the tumor. Um, however, one of the main problems when we use this kind of antennas in the treatment of tumors is the presence of increase in temperature in all the antenna. This increase in temperature uh, can produce uh, also a uh, increase in healthy tissue around the antenna. And this is a problem because it uh, can burn all the healthy tissue uh, surrounding the antenna. In that case, one of the main, pro uh, main solutions to above this increase in the temperature is the reduce of the input powers, the reduce of the treatment times, or in this case, the incorporation of a cooling system. Well, in this case, what is a cooling system? A cooling system is a plastic tube that co uh, covers all the antenna body. And in this cooling system, 
there is a, a cooling medium, for example, uh, water. And with this, uh, produce a decrease in the temperature in the antenna body, but also uh, the temperature in the healthy tissue is decreased. Mm, however, one of the main problems of the commercial cooling system is the need of um, high input power, for example, uh, higher than 30 watts. And this increase of the input powers is because the cooling system reduce the area of the of the ablation in this case in the in the bone tumors. For that reason, there is the necessity of design a new cooling system that does does not modify the antenna performance, and the ablation areas uh, are similar. So, but what is the objective of this uh, article? Is to propose a new cooling system to avoid undesired damage in the healthy tissue produced by the overheading of the antenna body. Moreover, the antenna performance and the input powers uh, must, but must not be affected uh, by the incorporation of the cooling system. In the materials and methods, I'm going to start with the design of the cooling system. The, the main difference between this cooling system and the commercial cooling system is that in this case, the cooling system not uh, completely cover the antenna body. In this case, the section of the antenna that will be in, co in contact with the t to 3 uh, will be exposed. With these modifications, um, the performance of the antenna um, will be not, be not be affected during the experimentations, and the areas of ablation will be similar in comparison with uh, not using the, the cooling system. And another uh, advantage of this design of the cooling system is that the input power uh, will be equal to 10 watts for five minutes of radiation. In the experiments, we use a water pump, as we can see in the, in the image. And this water pump uh, was connected with the cooling system to generate a water flow in all the the cooling system with the objective of uh, decrease the temperature in the antenna body. And to study the performance of the cooling system, a multi-layer uh, phantom was elaborated. In this case, the multi-layer phantom uh, emulate uh, cortical bone, muscle, and fat. In this slide, uh, we can see the experimental configuration using during the experiment. To study the performance of the cooling system, we use two different kinds of antennas, a monopole antenna and a double slot antenna. In the experiments, uh, we use three different uh, temperature sensors with the objective to study if the cooling system decreases the temperature in the muscle layer. And in the image, we can see the antenna with the incorporation of the cooling system uh, inserted into the, into the phantom. And these phantoms uh, have three layers, bone, muscle, and fat. And also we use a thermal camera to obtain the thermal distribution in, in all the experiments. As results, I'm going to start with the power loss. In the antenna, in the monopole antenna, when the cooling system was incorporated in the antenna, we, uh, we see an uh, increase in the power loss. In this, guy, in this case, the power loss uh, increased twice when the cooling system was including in the monopole antenna. This means that in that case, 
the cooling system affects the behavior of the antenna. On the other hand, with the double slot antenna, the incorporation of the cooling system reduces the power loss. In this case, the cooling system uh, not affect the performance of the antenna. And uh, about the maximum temperatures, when the cooling system was not incorporated in the antennas, we saw that in the, in the muscle layer, the temperature was even higher than 37 degrees Celsius, which is the uh, corporal temperature of the body in the two antennas. But when we incorporate the cooling system, now in the muscle layer, this temperature decreases and maintain in a range of a uh, temperature, uh, corporal temperature of the body, which means that the cooling system reduces the temperature around the, the antenna. And finally, about the heating patterns, in both cases, with the monopole and the double slot antenna, we saw the same uh, behavior. When the cooling system was incorporated in the antennas, the, the thermal distribution uh, reduced because of the presence of the cooling system. But uh, one uh, that is a uh, good, uh, uh, good results is that this reduce in the thermal distribution was uh, in the in the layer of muscle and fat. Uh, which means that the cooling system uh, only reduces the temperatures in the healthy tissue and the shape of the thermal distribution in the bone layer is the same. A discussion, um, this cooling system uh, modifies the shape of the thermal distribution, but this modification was most evident at the top of the heating pattern, where the pump muscle interface is found in the, in the phantom. And in the cooling system avoids heading in the muscle and focus the damage only in the, in the in, in this case, in the bone. As conclusions, this cooling system mm, decrease the temperature in the healthy tissue by six uh, degrees Celsius, keeping the temperature in the range of the corporal temperature of the body. The maximum power loss was 18% in the monopole antenna and 6% in the double slot antenna, uh, both using the cooling system. The heating patterns show that the cooling system modifies the pattern but improve bone targeting by reducing the damage in the muscle layer. And finally, this proposed cooling system reach ablation temperatures also by lowering the temperature in healthy tissue using an input power equal to 10 watts per five minutes of ablation. Um, that's all for me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you Excellent. for your presentation. Luis, apaga el micrófono porque se escucha eco. Check. Um, uh, uh, any questions uh, for Texar? No? Yeah. I have a question, Texar. Uh, uh, you point pointed out that um uh, uh, that you used uh, water uh, as a um refrigerate refrigerators. Uh, but uh, have you explored alternative uh, columns or refrigerators uh, to call the antenna 
in other words, or, uh, is it possible to use a better coolant that water to decrease more the decrease uh, of the antenna temperature? Mm, uh, yes. Um, we actually um, grouped with, uh, well, these modifications was in, in models. Uh, in the models, we use uh, water and also um, gas. But one of the principal problems is if you, uh, in this case, if este, I use gas to cooling medium, the decrease of the temperature in the muscle uh, was, in, uh, if I don't remember but the muscle decreased the temperature until 20 degrees Celsius. And it's something that is not good for the, for the tissue. And the water only decreases the temperature on the muscle and maintain the temperature uh, equal to the corporal temperature of the body. Okay, thanks, Art. Uh, another question in the room? No, no, nobody. Well, uh, Texar, thank you for your interesting presentations. Uh, uh, Dr. Garcia, uh, there is a question, right? Ah, thank ah. you, Esteban. Thank you, Esteban. So the question is, you you told us that the main problem was about the microwave um, flow and not maybe the characteristics of the uh, of the antenna, of the material um, with the antenna is made of. So, have you ever maybe tried to to integrate to the antenna some material that interferes uh, directly with the with the microwave flow and not with the heat? So, you are trying to to, to focus on the heating problem, um, but not maybe taking uh, in account the microwave flow, because you are focused on heating and not maybe the, the microwave energy. And it could be some material that can help you to avoid that heating. Uh, OK. Uh, yes. Uh, when I started with this investigation about to reduce the temperature in the antenna, one of the things that I I do is to cover the antenna, but not with water, also with with copper, because if you have a, a copper in the antenna body, it's like a, the heat of the antenna will be absorbed by the copper. But uh, if we want to reduce the temperature in the antenna, the copper that is around the antenna is, uh, is, is bigger. And this generates a, a damage in, in the bone tissue that it's not, uh, it's not the salt. Okay. Healthy tissue. Yes. OK. Thank you. Another question? No. Mm -hmm. that, that's all. That. No, I'm thinking. Um, um, Dr. Garcia, you, you have your uh, microphone turned off. Thank you. 
Dr. Luis, can you listen to me? You, you have your microphone turned no. Thank you, Stellan. Uh, Thank you, Stellan. Uh, now we can hear you. I, I forget activate my microphone. I forget activate my microphone. Sorry. Well, uh, let's continue with the well, yeah, presentation. Let's continue with the presentation. Uh, the next uh, the next speaker is um, uh, Arturo Gomez Mendoza from Instituto Instituto Nacional de Rehabilitación Mexico. Are you ready, Arthur, or you need uh, some time? to prepare your presentation. Can you hear me? Oh. Good evening, my name is Arturo Gonzalez Mendoza. I'm from the National Institute of Rehabilitation. I'm currently working in the Laboratory of Motion Analysis and Rehabilitation Engineering. Um, today I'm going to present to you the Unity Lower Limb Motion Capture Application uh, project that we are currently working. The content of the presentation is the following. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction about motion capture systems. I'll continue with the uh, uh, the main objective that we are persuade, that we are uh, persuading, and then I'll continue with the methodology, and finally I'll give the conclusion and show the references. Uh, motion capture systems are defined as the system that sample and record the motion of uh, of the living beings and 3D uh, and and objects as 3D data, so we can create animations such as in Figure One, where you can see that. Uh, when we capture the movements or facial expressions of a person, we can create movies or video games. But, uh, but also we can apply for the study of motion. When we apply the study of motion, we can create surveillance systems that can tell us, uh, give us information about what's happening. But this can be also a great tool for uh, that, that is being used for health, for rehabilitation and many other applications. Uh, in this case, in the literature, we can find uh, three types of uh, motion capture systems. In this case, the first one is a markerless, where just an optical system captures the motion. You use uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms, where you can track the body segments and, or, or just the silhouette of a person, and you can keep track of that. Uh, is commonly used in surveillance systems, but is not really uh, precise. But we have the gold standard, which is called the marker-based uh, systems. The marker-based use uh, some uh, little markers that are that reflect um, infrared light. So the cameras or the optical system detect these uh, little markers and these systems are really precise. They can keep a track of a movement of one millimeter. But thanks to the progress of technology, we have the inertial measurement, the inertial measurement units are becoming smaller and are becoming really affordable. And they are becoming really cheap in price. So these type of systems deliver us the uh, acceleration, the linear acceleration or angular or linear and angular velocity is the acceleration of, uh, of this inertial measurement unit. And through some processing, we can get the position or the angular position of the segment, and we can keep track of, uh, of some segments. These systems are very helpful since they don't use an optical system in the outside or in non-controlled environments. So, um, currently, in our laboratory, we have an optical system, which is really hard to take outside. So uh, we are starting to develop systems that allow us to study the motion of the persons outside or in their home. So that's why we are developing, uh, we are starting to develop systems based on inertial measurement units. 
In this case, uh, we are developing an application that is based in Unity and that keep tracks in the sagittal plane of a person for keeping track of the hip, the knee, and the heel. So this can allow us to uh, make gait analysis in the outside or in other parts. Uh, this is our proposal of the development of our application. It's a three-layer application software. In the first layer, it, uh, well, in this, uh, in the left from my <laughs> Side, you can see three boxes. These are the three layers that runs in Unity, and we have an outside layer that is being developed in C++. The part that is developed in Unity has the user interface that shows uh, the user avatar, the input boxes, and also some sensor boxes that show the movement of the sensors. The second layer is the is that is the layer that controls the first layer, the, the, the interface, but also calculate the joint angles of the person. And this layer, this logic layer, communicates with a data access layer. This layer is a, in the Unity system is a client which is in TCP EP that communicates through a through a server. To our, to our software development kit that uh, calculates the Euler angles of the inertia measurement units. Uh, so the inertia measurement units send the Euler angles, then we get the Euler angles, and then we calculate uh, the, the joint angles on the sagittal plane so we can make the analysis. So if we use the Euler angles, we can get the rotation matrix, which is shown in the equation one. This rotation matrix, each column uh, shows the uh, the vector of each uh, of each measurement unit. So we have just to apply a little uh, an easy um, geometric equation to calculate the angle, which is shown in equation two. And we just multiply the vectors that we inside in the plane, or we rotate them. In case of the sensor is uh, is flipped or is in rotation, and well, from figure three to eight, you can see what our, our that which are our vectors multiplication to calculate the angles from from each joint. Um, sorry. So. We have tested our system. Uh, we are well, currently we have a little bit more subjects, but uh, I'm going to present the results from one subject. Um, in this case, um, we have here we have positioned our measurement units. We have seven measurement units. One is our preference, and we have uh, two sensors in the thing, two sensors in the legs, and two sensors in the foot. So we can keep track of the heel, the, the the knee and the and the hip, and in order to compare with our world standard, which is the, our Bicon uh, optical system, we have used the plug and gate biomechanical model. We have to place uh, some markers in the user that which are infrared markers. In the figure ten, as you can see, you can see a user that has uh, some black straps. Uh, those black straps uh, are attached where uh, the inertia measurement units. And this user, uh, if you look closely, you can see some uh, little dots that are the infrared markers that are used in the Bicon system. So we put the user to walk in a seven meter um, uh, walk and we capture the data. Uh, this is our main interface in Unity. We have a, in the C region some controls that we interact with the user interface. The A part is the boxes that have that show the inertial measurement units moving, and in the B is the skeleton avatar that currently just moves the foot, well, the legs, with the different angles. Uh, so this is a example video. As you can see, we have here our user that has completely the, the markers and our inertial measurement units. And here, as you can see um, with a close up, uh, you can see how the boxes move along the user is moving and also the avatar is moving. Uh, so 
what we obtain from this analysis is the joint angles, which are the pattern of the gate. Uh, we have cut in the, we use the knee signals and we uh, cut in the minimum of this signal. So we can read from one uh, step closely of these signals. So we make our subject to walk five times in our path and we uh, get the mean and the standard deviation. In blue, you can see what is the result of the Bicon system, while in red is the initial and measurement units uh, results. This is the left leg and right leg. And we have done this for the hip, the knee, and the ankle. So we have here a summary of the results. And in this case, the biggest uh, error that we, uh, the root mean square error that we got in the system was from the knee, uh, in the left knee, where we got a 9.9 .9, uh, error degree error. And we consider that this error is because, uh, is done because of the positioning of the sensors. We have to be very careful at the start on how we position these sensors, because if you move, you lose the position. Or if these sensors move a little bit, you can also get a little bit error. Uh, of course, this is just a rough approximation of the joint angles that we want to acquire. But we are going, we are going to work in better algorithms and better things to make a precise uh, measurement. So what we have found is that Unity has a great set of tools that allow us to handle 3D data, and it really is a really good uh, tool to develop uh, the systems. In the future, we want to integrate a little bit uh, cheaper uh, sensors. We don't need. Uh, we don't need uh, really expensive sensors. We can use some cheap sensors, but um, uh, and also uh, we think that this algorithm, even that is really simple, it can be used for some uh, rehabilitation gain therapies on some things uh, in the future like that. And um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you have some questions. Thank you. Uh, some questions. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, what is the uh, Latency the, uh, of the system proposed that you proposed. Um, it means uh, is it appropriate uh, to classify the proposed system as a real time system? Well, uh, currently the sensors, since we have uh, seven sensors, they run up to or they acquire the data up to 50 hertz. Uh, the minimum velocity for gate analysis that we need is 20 hertz. So we actually are, we, we, we have the, we comply with the minimum uh, uh, sampling rate. Uh, we, we, I, I wouldn't say that is free and real time, but it looks like it's real time, the, the fluency of the program. Oh, oh, okay. Um, oh, oh, okay. So, uh, um, where is the uh, system's uh, bottleneck uh, regarding time transmissions, processing, or viewing? Viewing. Yes, actually, uh, we we are getting the, the greatest help that we have in the developed system is that we. <laughs> divide the part that handles the, the hard processing in the C++ language. C++ language is uh, has a great communication with the hardware and mm -hmm. is really fast for making mm -hmm. these uh, hard processing algorithms. The hard part of working with the inertial and measurement units is the part where you have to get the regular angles because you have to apply many filters and make many things. Uh, but once we we solve that part in C++, we just send the data and make easy calculations in Unity. 
So thanks to so 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 actually the advice is to better use a uh, low level programming. Uh, a good uh, a good help is C plus plus. It has a great uh, handling of this part. <laughs> So that, that would be the advice for mm -hmm. older works. I, and in our case, it was the same. Okay, Arturo, congratulations for this yeah, uh, Congratulations uh, for this uh, uh, job. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, uh, another question in the room? Another question in the room? Yeah. Uh, so, Let's give a round of applause. Uh, let's continue with the following presentation. With the following presentation. Let me see. Let me see. The next speaker is Juan Pablo Cavazos Carrizales from Centro de Investigación y de Estudios Avanzados del Instituto Politécnico Nacional, Unidad Saltillo, México. Are you ready, Juan Pablo? Yes, we are getting ready. It's a moment. Okay. Uh, okay, take some uh, Take some time to, to stay ready. To stay ready. Okay, we are ready. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Juan Pablo Cavascarizales. Okay. Um, and I'm going to present our computer vision interface for symbolic programming of Cartesian motion to introduce visually impaired children into robotic science. I will start by introducing um, the importance of teaching robotic science to visually impaired children and show our ludic non-visual symbolic programming platform and its most important components. The programming environment, which includes the tokens and the programming board, and the computer vision assistant and how it executes its recognition and interpretation. Finally, I will talk about the final implementation and results. Uh, the robotic science are a multidisciplinary research area that considers the artificial intelligence and the study of autonomous mechanisms and their interaction with humans. They are an attractive opportunity for professional fulfillment that must be instilled from a young age. However, they require a clear, special perception of mechanical motion and the ability to describe it in a logical and structured way. Children are en encouraged to participate in robotics by means of ludic platforms that help them to describe the movements of basic mechanisms and coding algorithms for ordinary motion tasks. So, Examples of these platforms are like the Coveto by Promotoys, the Coding AWI by Osmo, the Extractor by Algobricks, or the Lego Boss by Lego. Unfortunately, teaching and didactic materials are mainly visual, which excludes blind or partially sight children for an, in, an early inclusion in robotics which is a big disadvantage as stated by professional developers and researchers 
that regret the lack of non visual didactic education in the early years. Um, a tool to help with to help with this situation will need to be specifically designed for visually impaired children, mainly focusing on using their uh, alternative senses available, such as touch and sound. The tool also should be safe and comfortable to use and be friendly not only for the visually impaired children, but also for the instructor. Lastly, the adequate tool should have a teaching strategy of travel complexity challenge that teach basic programming concepts. Mm, for this uh, previous version of uh, Symbolic Programming Platform was developed on the Simbestab and industry. Industrias Plásticas Martín to program Cartesian motion of a mobile robot. It had a programming board and assembly tokens in a sequence of commands for immediate experimentation with a real robot. It also used the new alternative sensors with audio message as position feedback and braille for identification. However, it has some drawbacks due to the electrical sockets that caused uh, common problems on connection and requires awkward manipulation of every token, as you can see in the bottom image. Also, the need to have an embedded system inside every token causes high cost of production, which is against one of its main objectives. Of being affordable. Um, to improve on that version, we post an artificial vision system based on contour detection to recognize symbols and numbers input by the user. Uh, these numbers are translated into a sequence of instructions and executed in real time for instant reinforcement. Um, we had to redesign the tokens to work with the artificial vision system. And also at the same time to improve the handling and recognition. The visual recognition preserves, preserves the working space free of obstacles. And another advantage is that it simplifies programming by only sliding together tokens in a flat board instead of having to handle them separately to the board and then moving in the inside. It is also more reliable and, and uh, has more longevity by replex, replacing complex parts with simple with simple ones, like replacing the Arduino inside every token with a webcam for the whole interface. The computer vision interface can be explain with these three main elements, the tokens and programming boards, the artificial vision system, which is three stage, and the mobile robot for immediate experimentation. The tokens are symbolic commands of Cartesian motions. As you can see in the image, these are our commands. The First, going a step forward, turn left, turn right, subroutine, and conditionals. Each with the symbol, straight arrow, curve arrow to the left, curve arrow to the right, subroutine, and conditionals. Also, every small track, small track has a braille code, which a letter that identifies the command. A for forward, B for right. I for left, S for subroutine, and C for conditional. These plates also have other functionality by using numbers as removable plates. The base is a gener generic one, where in the top space we can put the command symbol that stays fixed in the 
space where the bottom space can be can have different numbers that represent the number of times the commands are going to be repeated. The on the tokens also have high relief symbols by colors and markings for easy recognition, not only by the user but also the optic system. The programming board is a flat horizontal opaque opaque surface with dimensions adjusted for uh, children of age six and plus, taking into account their upper extremities. Um, it has strings of tokens to form the code in the form of three ports for pro for main program and two ports for subroutine and decisions. On the left side, you can see in the second image, there's a Cartesian display for orientation and planning, and below that, three buttons for start, stop, and pause. Inside there is also of the main processor to safeguard it from children. The first stage of the artificial vision system is the image acquisition. It happens in a semi controlled light environment. It has a ring of uniform diffuse frontal illumination to avoid glare and shadows on the board, which you can see in the top of the image. And the image capture is done by a conventional webcam of adjustable focus. We did various experiments to select the best light with this being the the best results, white frontal light. The second stage of the artificial vision system is the pre-processing. It improves the acquired image by changing the visual properties before being analyzed for command searching. First, we fix the distort caused by the fish eye effect of the lens, then we resize the Image to only work on the region of interest. And finally, we change the original color image to grayscale to a binary image for, uh, with a threshold to get the relevant data. The third stage of the artificial vision system is the command detection, which is based on finding, finding the boundary object functions. Of the in the image to compare to a database. The, the first step is to use a contour detection algorithm to, to binarize image resulting in a vector of directions. These directions are addressed to points at, along the edge of every symbol found. Then this vector is filtered by size and brightness to remove noise from the original image that might remain from the pre-processing. And we, we look for the center of mass. This is used to find the boundary object function, which is the distance from the center of mass to every point in the control bank. The boundary object function is set in a vector and normalized. To finally be compared with a database using uh, the same process done to the image to find the best similarity. The database use was of 619 image of every combination of tokens available. We also have the mobile robot, which received the translated instructions from the main processor. Uh, this works like a dictionary of boundary object functions to instructions. These instructions are sent to the robot via Bluetooth. The robot uh, has media experimentation for Cartesian movements in a move and wait control strategy. The decisions are made by the central processor 
to leave the robot with so the need to have to do hard decisions only sending relevant information of its surroundings. We did um, the tokens, the ports and plates in 3D print in field A for low weight and high durability. We, the colors are have a contrast for easy detection of the artificial uh, vision. The camera and illumination setup include the ring of white light, which I talked about, and a normal USB webcam with a resolution of 1024 by 768 light bulbs. Mm, all the processing on the interface is done in a uh, Raspberry Pi as the main processor, which was selected because of, the, of its flexibility and uh, availability and its affordability. There's also an Arduino Micro used as a for communication with the mobile robot. We did a couple of tests, a recognition algorithm test, and which test every combination of symbols and number properly detected. Uh, test the different colors and locations. Excuse me, Juan Pablo, two minutes. The, Excuse me, Juan Pablo, two minutes. Yes. Okay. The second test is the test, test the program system and translation to code. The, and finally, just the complete process, which is just the robot uh, activation the detection sees the image, extracts the relevant information, and the robot moves in a weight and move and weight approach. Mm. The results are that we, the detection were stable as long as we had uh, constant light conditions uh, with the proper contrast. Finally, we presented the design and implementation of a didactic platform to include children with visual impairment in robotics. We improved this with the artificial vision system for better and safer interactions with children. Um, for the future, we need to do more tests with visually impaired users to have more inter iterations of the feedback loop and use that to improve the utility, reduce cost, and maybe change the output for different actuators like uh, multiple degree of li liberty roles. And that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, any questions? Hi. Uh, well, I saw that the system is very simple uh, to assemble, and, and I think that because of that, it will be very easy to teach the children how to program. Uh, do you think that your system is suitable to be used for non-blind children also? Yes, that was one of our main concerns. That's why we included different colors and attractive um, shapes. Also because the visual impaired children are not always 100% blind. This also could be an advantage on that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anything else? Other question? Other question? No? No? Well, uh, I have uh, a question. Uh, well, um, uh, when I begin a uh, engineering project, I one feel uh, so excited to to to, to give a uh, excellent solutions and forget uh, uh, others uh, topics. Uh, so um, uh, 
let me construct the, the, the question. See, so, oh. um, some uh, have some children tried uh, uh, try the, uh, the system to detect improving points. Mm, yes, uh, many of the aspects of what the science to be focused on programming boards. Uh, sorry, repeat that again. No, uh, continue, continue, Juan Pablo. Uh, continue, continue, Juan Pablo. Okay, thanks. Uh, many of the uh, aspects of design of the Tokestan programming board were um, done after testing with uh, actual vision impaired children, which um, was feedback to that pushed us to change the design again, and this is the result of that. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Uh, another question? Mm -hmm. no? no, we don't have any. No. Okay. No. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, Thank again, you. Let's Pablo. get a round of applause to the speaker. A round of applause to the speaker. Let's go with the uh, uh, so with the next presentation. Um, um, the next speaker is Laura Ivonne Flores Núñez from Centro de Investigación y de Estudios Avanzados del Instituto Politécnico Nacional de Bioelectrónica in Mexico. Uh, are you ready, Laura Ivonne, or you need some time? in some time. Um, yeah, uh, one minute. Okay, Laura. Let's start. Okay, Laura. Let's start. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Laura Flores and I'm going to present to you the work title J Wave Detection Algorithm of the DCG in Chair and Bed Using Continuous Explain Wavelet Transfer. In the recent years, there's been a growing demand on monitoring technologies in non hospital environments for prevention, prediction, and treatment of cardiovascular diseases. Fortunately, advances in sensor technology in terms of cost and size have renewed the interest in forgotten techniques like the ballistocardiogram. That's why different systems have been proposed by embedding sensors in everyday objects like office chairs, wheelchairs, beds, and waiting scales. By definition, the ballistocardiogram is a record of the micro movements of the body that are produced by the recall forces that are generated in each heartbeat due to the changes in the center of mass from the whole body by the rapid acceleration of blood as it suggested to the vascular tree. These forces can be measured as displacement, velocity, or acceleration in three different geometric axes. Help the foot if it's measured in the longitudinal or vertical axis. Dorsal ventral if it's measured in the transverse or anterior posterior axis, and lateral if it's measured from left to right. In this image, we can see a typical BCG where the J wave is the most prominent wave and it's also used as a reference for every cardiac cycle. The challenges for the J wave detection are that its morphology varies between subjects, measurement device, and the measurement axis. Also, most of the work only focus on a single axis and a single position for the BCG records, and only few public databases exist, making it difficult to standardize its location. That's why 
different techniques have been proposed, like signal envelope, digital filters, continuous wavelet transform, discrete wavelet transform, multi-resolution analysis of the maximal overload discrete wavelet transform, or adaptive bait shape model. Without only wavelet analysis, have proven to be effective for this particular non-stationary signal. That's why the objective of this work is to propose an algorithm based on CWG with spine uh, for the J-wave detection, regardless of the type of sensor or the measurement axis. For this task, we considered 22 records from two different DCG databases. The first database was a chair database uh, obtained by Luna Lozano by a piezoelectric sensor attached to a seat of a chair at a sample rate of 1 kilohertz, but these records have a short duration between 60 and 100 seconds, and were band limited between 0.5 to 20 hertz. The second uh, database used was a public best database obtained by Carlson by electromechanical team placed on the base of a bed at a sample rate of 1 kilohertz, but with a, with a longer duration between 5 and 7 minutes. These records were also band limited between 0.3 to 24 hertz. From this database, we only choose 15 records that met the same criteria that the other database. The first step for the J-wave detection was applying the CWT with the spline. In general, the CWT consists of convolution integral between the signal and the mother wave that function, in which the scale and translation parameter is modified. In this case, we use the first derivative of a fourth order cubic V spline wave that transform as a mother wave that function that give us the advantage to have a good time frequency resolution. The use of these line functions allows us to use a wide range of scales, not limited to a power of two. The mathematical representation of this is equivalent to this polynomial strength function that gives us the advantage of reduction of noise and mechanical interferences, and also the behavior as a band pass filter. The following steps were the signal preposes in part for both databases with digital bandpass filters with a first surface between 0.5 to 25 hertz with a 150 order using Hamming width. This only just to match the bandwidth of, from both databases. The features of this detection were that we use a similar structure reported by Alvarado with some important improvements. First, uh, a different mother wavelet function was chosen for the increment of the wavefront. Then we, we select the scale pipe with cut off frequencies from 46 to 155. Then we implement such windows that were ad adapted to minimal changes in heart rate for the J-wave detection. Uh, and also we implement point correction by performing for forward and backward searches. And finally, we implement multiple validation points to avoid false negative detection. This algorithm is divided into two stages. The first stage is the learning stage, where the first four J waves are found. Uh, by applying the CWT on a BCG signal, we obtain a negative and a positive modulus, where it's zero cross in between them corresponds to every peak present on the signal. That's why in order to find the J-wave peak, first we found the maximum and the minimum modulus in the first two seconds to determine a positive and a negative threshold. Then the first four J-waves above that threshold are accepted, and then we calculate the heart rate and the JJ interval for uh, the establishment for the initial search point for the other J waves. The second stage is the decision stage, and then we first calculate the search window using the average 
from the previously detected J waves. Then all the J wave peak candidates are evaluated under two main criteria, amplitude and time. As you can see in this picture, we must ensure to find the best J wave location that um, fills all the parameters. That's why this algorithm is designed to do to perform a forward or either a backward search or to perform a further search in order to find the correct J wave. Once the J wave is located, this process is repeated until all the other J waves are found. The results for the bed database were that we only obtained 80 false positives and 8 false negatives out of a 6,650 bits. And we obtained a sensitivity of 99.89, a positive predictivity of 98.9, and a true positive detection of 98.79. For the cherry database, we obtain uh, only six false, false positives and zero false negatives out of uh, 779 bits. In this case, the sensitivity was of 100%. Uh, a positive productivity was uh, 99.48 for 20, 24, and also the true positive detection. In addition, to verify the um, to be, to verify the results, we carry out the Van Alman test, a statistical test, to find the agreement between the heart rate calculated from the JJ intervals from the DCG and the RR intervals from the ECG that is considered as a reference signal. For the chair database, we obtained a confidence interval of plus minus. 3.48 bits per minute and a mean error of minus 0.05 bits per minute. For the bed database, we obtained a confidence interval of plus minus 3.87 bits per minute and a mean error of minus 0.03 bits per minute. These results have an acceptable uh, agreement according to the accuracy limits of plus minus 5 bits per minute uh, for the heart rate measurement standard established by the Association for the Advanced, Advancement of Medical Instrumentation. To show the robustness of this algorithm, here we have a segment of a cherry database and a segment of the red database. As you can see in these two segments, uh, the morphology is different between both databases. And in these two pictures, we can also see the big difference between the amplitude and the morphology between both database, databases. And in spite of that, the algorithm was capable of detecting the J wave, uh, the correct J wave in all the cases. The conclusions are that the detection of the G wave can be a complex task to perform due to their change in morphology, especially if a reference signal is not being used, like the ECG. The use in this case of the continuous wave transform, transform with the spline allows to discard high amplitude and low frequency peaks due to the baseline variations and mechanical interferences that are always present in the ECG signal. The performance of the proposed algorithm was found to be within the accuracy limit established by the AAMI for the heart rate measurement without focusing on a specific morphology as is generally done. And finally, as future aim, we will continue working on the development of a universal algorithm for automatic and supervised detection of DCT waves, independent of sensor and measurement axis in order to obtain, analyze, and develop BCG technology. These are the references used, and that will be okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Laura, Yvonne. Uh,
Uh, any questions? No? Well, uh, I have a question, uh, Laura. I have a question, uh, Laura. Yes. Uh, I didn't know about the ballistic, ballistic cardiogram technique, but I can imagine additional uh, additional applications such as uh, sports. Uh, uh, actually, I interest in application in sport. So, do you think this technique can be used in the future to, uh, to estimate the heart rate uh, under condition of body movements? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is actually the uh, not invasive technique, so mm -hmm. that's the great advantage. Mm -hmm. But also, the negative advantage, the negative is uh, that um, as we, uh, as the VCT record, the micro movements of the body, I don't think uh, this kind of signal is um, for more movement. Like if you do. Uh, an exercise that involves a lot of uh, energy or mm -hmm. motion, then maybe the, uh, it's going to complicate the detection. Okay. Okay. Uh, probably uh, I have to check some other options. But, may, uh, but maybe you can use it after the exercise. Or, or maybe if, if you want to measure other other kind of variables. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, other question? Uh, other question? No. No. no, no okay. No, no. Let's give a round of applause to uh, Let's give a round, Laura. Uh, okay, uh, let's go. Uh, uh, we have let's go. Uh, following uh, presentation. Uh, the next speaker uh, uh, is uh, Lauro, Lauro Armando Contreras Rodriguez from Centro de Investigación y de Estudios Avanzados del Instituto Politécnico Nacional de Electrónica. Mexico. Uh, are you ready, uh, Lauro? Ready, Lauro? Uh, Just one moment. Okay. Okay. Now we are ready. Okay, let's start for Laura. Let's start for Laura. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Armando Contreras. I'm going to present my work uh, entitled Human Hyperlim Function Recognition Using IMO Sensors and Artificial Neural Networks. The purpose of this work is to explore the possibility of using IMO data to fit an artificial neural network in order to recognize uh, activities of the living. Research on human motion has been a big focus on, uh, for investigation in three main areas. The motion analysis of the human body structure, the tracking of the human motions, and the recognition of the human movements. Artificial neural network, artificial neural network has become a, a, of, great, of great use in order to recognize motion, since they recognize the patterns of, of the different uh, uh, information acquired by EMG signals, vision systems, or wearable sensors. <clears throat> However, uh, EMG signals effic uh, average efficiency, efficiency is about 70 percent uh, when when used for this application, and they require advanced 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 techniques 
for the detect detection, the composition, processing, and classification before the, its use on artificial neural network networks. <clears throat> Uh, vision systems requires of specific conditions in order to acquire the, the data, like the light conditions, uh, several cameras to avoid occlusion, and to improve the accuracy, they require of markers. Uh, they require of markers, and uh, its usage on outdoors environments requires of of very spe specific conditions that cannot be uh, cannot be. Uh, Okay, uh, outdoor analysis remains a challenge since the conditions of life may be something that you cannot control during these uh, conditions. Finally, the wearable sensors uh, are becoming the most popular option since they are not invasive, provide information uh, related to the three dimensional space of the motion of the segments, can be used outdoors, and they don't have a problem of occlusion like vision systems. In the, con uh, the contrary, they are susceptible to electromagnetic signals, and the accuracy compared to the visual si the vision system is low. However, they are being used recently for this kind of analysis, since they provide uh, relevant information, even though the accuracy is lower than the vision, vision systems. For this project, we use uh, wearable sensors uh, called Xsense Dot from the same for the company with the same name. Uh, on T healthy ten, and 10 healthy volunteers using a sample rate of 60 Hertz. Uh, result, uh, these devices have a, a sampling rate of, rate of 60 Hertz, a resolution of 16 bits, and they use the Xsense latest common filter form algor algorithm, which is an algorithm uh, dedicated to the human motion analysis. Uh, for this project, uh, the tech helping volunteers, four females and six males, ages uh, 39 years plus less 15.9 years, uh, were asked to make seven different activities, which are static position, which requires a person to be standby in a neutron pose, the shoulder flexion extension, the shoulder abduction abduction, the, sh the elbow flexion extension, the wrist flexion extension, wrist abduction abduction, and a movement called reach to rush, reach to rush, which requires the person to reach to an object placed in a table in front of them to rust to rust it. <clears throat> the total of, of samples uh, acquired with this test were 42,356, which were used to fit the artificial neural network. Uh, According to the architecture of the artificial neural network, we have an input vector of 16 uh, data related to the four data provided by each of the four samples we use for measuring the test. Uh, for the test, we use a sensor located in the thorax, and one in the arm, one in the forearm, and one in the hand uh, to acquire information of the seven activities we, we talked previously. For the higher layer, we use seven neurons used to recognize the patterns of the movements, and the outer layer have seven neurons used, neurons used to identify each of the movements according to which a neuron is active at the output of the network. For both the higher layer and the outer layer, we use a sigmoid uh, function activation due to its uh, derivation properties. We use a factor of the learning factor of 0.1 of 0.1, <clears throat> and we use the training algorithm algorithm of backpropagation of the error. Uh, from the whole database, uh, we use 75 percent of the of the samples to train the model, and 25 to test and the at the end of the training session. During the training session, we we segmented the training set. In for a cross validation with a k value equals to three, which divides the, the training set in three different segments, which are used uh, for creating three different models to, to validate the, the, the uh, training session. <clears throat> for the results of this uh, training, we get the performance of uh, an average performance of 97.51%. And for all the tests we made, the convergence, the convergence to the error established of 0.01 was 
was uh, um, was achieved on six iterations. Uh, the performance using the set, the test set, was 97.39 percent, which which is similar to the performance obtained during the, the training session. The matrix, the confusion matrix presented on the on the on your left, right to your right, is uh, the results obtained for the test set applied to the trained uh, artificial neural network, uh, where the classes were determined as follows. The class one, uh, which corresponds to the C1, corresponds to the static position, C2 to the flexion extension, extension of the shoulder, C3, the abduction, abduction of the shoulder, C4, the flexion extension of the elbow, C5, the flexion extension of the wrist, C6 uh, was the abduction abduction of the wrist, and C7, the wrist to wrist movement. <clears throat> and in complement to the other results, we create a receiving operator operating characteristic cure to determine the the I, the, the idoneous uh, value for this classifier for this uh, neural network as a classifier. For this, we make a, a comparison between each of the class against the rest, uh, against the rest, to create a small uh, confusion matrix of only one class versus the, the, the all, all of the rest. For this, uh, we, uh, with this information, we create this and we calculate the sensibility, specificity, and accuracy for all uh, for all the classes on the for the artificial neural network. The value of the area under the curve presented on the first part of the table uh, determines uh, how good is the is that as a classifier. According to the theory, uh, a value close to one indicates that the classifier, the classificator, is good for the activity it is presented. <clears throat> as a discussion, uh, we we think that the that this work is the possibility to recognize the movements of the human hyperdim using IMU sensors combined with an artificial neural network. The results obtained above the uh, 90 percent for the accuracy indicates that this uh, artificial neural network for this application uh, is a good classifier for the patterns presented to the, to the artificial neural network. Uh, the range reported for the intention prediction of the hyperdim movements is uh, around the same values that we uh, acquired for this uh, uh, for our accuracy, so it will be used uh, uh, to determine the which movement uh, we are we are doing in the initial stages of the of the movement. And the values of the area under the close close to one indicates that it uh, has a high reliability to predict between different classes uh, uh, with the patterns uh, that we propose. <clears throat> As a conclusion, we. We, we conclude that it is possible to recognize activities of field living using the patterns of uh, using the raw data of uh, and wearable sensors in combination with an artificial neural network to determine activities of field living. Uh, we think that, the, that this information could provide additional information that can be used for medical diagnosis uh, according to the movements that, that we that we register with these sensors. We could determine if the movement is doing uh, according to what a uh, characteristic cure could be done for each of the movements. It could predict the outcome in the initial stage of, of the movements according to the patterns we that we get for each of the movements. And uh, this information can be could be used in industry and in virtual uh, environments to determine optimal trajectories for robot for industrial robots or to for applications of the virtual environments. <clears throat> uh, that's all. Here are my references. Okay, thank you, uh, Lauro. Okay, thank you, uh, Lauro. Okay, question or questions? No? Okay. I have a question, Lauro. So, how do you just make the number of the, the okay. number of okay. the
Esteban. Ok, ok, Esteban. Okay, uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, this technique is just for the upper limb that can be used to the the rest of the body. It should require um, the, the patterns for the movement you want to to just to identify. For example, if you want to identify the person who's walking, you have to take a you have to train the neural network to to identify the patterns of the walking activity. So it could be improved to, to identify more movements, okay. but it will require a um, uh, training session with those patterns to to be able to identify. Okay. <clears throat> Other question? Other question? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let me ask you, uh, let me. Lauro. Uh, how do you use to make the uh, the number of neurons in the layers of the artificial neural uh, network? Uh, I I know that uh, is. It's a hard work to, to to find the number of neurons in the layers. So uh, I would like to know what what do you do? That? Okay, uh, for the output layer, I decide to use seven neurons since I have to classify seven different movements. In theory, you could use only one neuron to identify all the movements. However, the uh, process to train a network with use one neuron or seven different uh, classes to identify, uh, get some more complicated uh, training. So I just decided to use seven for one for each uh, uh, movement. For the hidden layer, uh, uh, there's no um, there's no indicated pa pa pattern of how to select the narrow you have to use. Uh, most of the time you have you do it by trial and error. However, there's uh, have been um, studies where they say that according to the to the position of the patterns you want to recognize on the deeper space, you could draw lines between them to identify more or less how many how many neurons you require to determine the patterns of the different uh, of the different movements and and with this you can select the number of neurons in the higher layer. <clears throat> okay, well, well, thank you. Uh, okay. Other questions? No? no, we don't have any. Okay. any. We don't have any questions. Okay. Let's give a round of applause. Let's give a round of applause to the speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to, uh, Let's go to, to the following follow presentation. The following presentation. Uh, the next speaker is Luis Carlos Olivares Rueda uh, from Benemérita Universidad Autónoma de Puebla, Mexico. Uh, are you ready, Luis? <laughs> Okay, it's it's not ready. Uh, he's not ready yet. He's not ready yet.
Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Olivares, and I am uh, from the Benemerito University of Autónoma de Puebla in Short Web. And I am going to talk about simulation of PCR kinetics in convective flow systems. Uh, this is the index. I'm gonna. I'm going to talk about the PCR. What is the problem and a proposed simulation? I'm going to talk about the proposed simulation and the results and conclusion. First of all, what is the polymerase reaction? In short, PCR. Well, uh, first, it was created by Karim Mullis around the year 1983, and is is one of is one of the most widely used techniques for molecular diagnosis around the world. Uh, it, it amplifies fragments of DNA. Uh, the PCR uh, consists of, su of, su of subjecting a mixture of, acid, of nucleic acids and enzymes to thermal cycles. The PCR mixture contains a DNA sample of where the target region of interest is in the DNA, the NTPs, which are the blocks for the construction of new DNA strands, primers, DNA polymerases. The DNA polymerases uh, creates new, new strands of DNA by binding to the primers and taking the NTPs from the environment. And a buffer solution. The PCR consists of three main steps. The first step is called denaturation. And the PCR mixture is heated to at approximately 95 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, the hydrogen bonds of the double stranded DNA become unstable and they denature. The second step is called annealing. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, the process of annealing, the, mixture, the PCR mixture is cooled at approximately 55 degrees Celsius. At uh, this temperature, the primers bind to the single stranded DNA. And the third and last step is called extension. Uh, <clears throat> this is the step where the DNA polymerases binds to the, to the primers and start extending a new single strand DNA complementary. To the to the one that the primer binded. The PCR technique is really important because it helps us for detecting um, some illnesses, and we have seen and we have recently seen this in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, caused by the SARS-CoV-2, in which the PCR play a, played an important role by early detecting um, people with the, um, with the infection of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the quantitative PCR, in short qPCR, is a variation of the PCR. Uh, <clears throat> this technique, uh, this variation of PCR allows us to measure the um, amplification of the DNA in real time by the use of fluorophores that emit fluorescence. As we can see in this image, um, we can distinguish four different phases, a ground phase, an exponential phase that transitions to a linear phase, and finally to a plateau phase. Um, what is the problem with the PCR? Well, the most of the PCR per the most of the devices, uh, sorry, the most, the most of the devices for performing PCR tests are designed to be used in laboratories. And this is a problem because they are bulky, they are so expensive and require a high electrical consumption. Este, but we have another problem. If we want to design uh, better PCR devices, uh, we are facing well, this can be very expensive and time consuming because we need to, <clears throat> when we design a new device, we are facing a trial and error experiments. Uh, well, 
Actually, the computer simulation al al allows us to perform faster, <clears throat> faster designing and faster and cheaper designing for new devices, and helps us finding the best operational parameters to <clears throat> try in the real life experiment. <clears throat> Well, uh, for the simulations, I utilize a software named Console Multiphysics, in specific the version 5.3, which provides a multiphysics environment for performing and <clears throat> analysis for different phenomena. The proposed PCR device is a borosilicate glass capillary tube of 64 millimeter long. 0 0.79 millimeter inner diameter and 1.082 millimeter outer diameter and is shaped in a closed loop in a triangular closed loop. Uh, as we can see in this image, there, there are three temperature zones that are held at a constant temperature that are held at a constant temperature. Uh, these temperatures correspond to the different steps in the PCR the annealing zone, the extension zone, and the denaturation zone. <clears throat> As I said, the three zones correspond to the PCR steps. Este, a CAD model was created with AutoCAD, uh, which is a computer aided design software. <clears throat> and here we can see the domains of the, <clears throat> of the device. Inside the capillary glass tube, um, was the fluid domain, and the <clears throat> and the domain that encloses the fluid domain is the glass. Well, the next step when we <clears throat> when we export the CAD model to Compson Multiphysics is creating a mesh in the geometry. An automatic mesh was created using the finer mesh option. In the following table, you can see some of the parameters generated in the in the meshing process. Well, for the fluid model, um, it was used the steady state Navier stock equations and the steady state continuity equation. Um, here, the first equation is the Navier stock, and the second one, the continuity state. Here, uh, G, uh, well, first, F is other forces, uh, where the other forces are defined to be the um, force exerted, exerted by the gravity. And G is the gravity acceleration vector, rho is the density of the fluid, U is the velocity vector of the fluid, P, the pressure of the fluid, and mu, the dynamic viscosity. <clears throat> Some of the conditions considered for all simulations were rigid walls, boundary in a slip condition, initial temperature at 24 degrees Celsius, and initial pressure of one atmosphere. The thermal model used was the steady state heat equation, which we can see here. And C, the, C subscript P is the calorific head capacity of the fluid, U is the molecular velocity of the fluid, K the coefficient of thermal conductivity of the solid, and capital Q is the rate of head generated in the device. Here, Q is zero everywhere, everywhere at the in the device, except at the constant temperature zones defined in the three different sites. <clears throat> For the thermal model, we consider rigid walls, uh, again, in an initial temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, and initial pressure of one atmosphere. The transport of diluted species model used is the time-dependent mass transport equation, um, considering the effects of convection. Here we can see the mass flux vector and D, the diffusion coefficients of the different chemical species involved in the reactions. <clears throat> These are the diffusion coefficients, C, the concentrations, R, the production rate of the different species, T the time and U the velocity vector of the fluid. And uh, here uh, we can see a table where the different species parameters are fixed. The diffusivity terms and the initial concentration. 
Next, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about the PCR kinetics model. Uh, as I said before, um, several chemical species are involved in the reactions. Here, a five-step process, a five-step model was used for the um, reaction kinetics. Um, the processes are a process of denaturation, renaturation, uh, renaturation is the opposite to the denaturation, annealing and reverse annealing, and extension. Seven chemical species are involved. S1, S2, which are the double-stranded DNA, S1 and S2, uh, which are the single-stranded DNA, S1, P2, and S2, P1, which are the complexes formed by the single-stranded DNA and the primers. And P1 and P2 are the primers. <clears throat> Here we can see the chemistry model for each one of the processes. As the, here, the reaction coefficients are seen in the following table. Uh, for denaturation, renaturation, annealing, and reverse annealing. As the, sorry, the subscript of the K coefficients uh, indicates, the, uh, indicates the process of, of, indicates the different process. The D coefficient, the D subscript indicates the denaturation the denaturation process, the this script with a minus indicate I, the rate coefficient of the orientation. Uh, other constants required for the PCR kinetic model are this <coughs> and the simulation. Um, as you can saw, the we are dealing with steady state equations and time dependent station. But why is this? Well, first, um, a time a stationary study was performed with the um, with the fluid motion with the fluid motion and the heat transfer in fluid module, and a second study, uh, which is a time dependent study, were performed with the um, PCR kinetics model. <clears throat> Here, as I said, we use the heat transfer in fluids module from console and the gripping float module. And we're coupled with a submodel for mode physics uh, called non-isothermal flow. <clears throat> uh, this study calculates the temperature and velocity fields on the device and calculates the average temperature and velocity of the fluid. The, the second study, the time dependent study, is the, couples the chemistry module and the transport of the diluted species model. Uh, this study uses the, um, the temperature and velocity field calculated in the um, stationary study. Uh, but why we are doing this? Um, well, we are just considering, ah, I forgot to say it in the fluid model, we are, we are just considering changes of density in the fluid only due by the changes of, by the difference of temperature. This causes um, that some parts of the fluid, the, <clears throat> the most hot parts of the fluid, become less dense. Um, <clears throat> the more cold fluid, the colder fluid, the colder part of the fluid <clears throat> starts exerting a force on the less dense fluid and a process of natural convection flows start. Ah, well, also, the time-dependent study calculates the concentration over time of all the different chemical species involved in the reactions. Um, when we do that, when we did that, as the, it was because uh, we are not considering changes in density because of pressure and concentration of the different species. This means that in a short period of time, and the length of the and the length scale of the system, um, two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. The thermal gradients will stop varying, and in consequence, the flow, the, the vector, the velocity vector field will stop varying too. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this. Uh, well, in the results, we obtain a a velocity profile similar to a parabolic profile. This is because the, um, 
the no slip condition boundary, and <clears throat> uh, but the the flow can be normal to the world. The temperature distribution shows us the direction of the fluid, which is counterclockwise. Uh, in this reference, this, <clears throat> this example, uh, uh, we obtain a, <clears throat> uh, this is an example of the um, concentration over time of the different chemical species uh, <clears throat> of the simulations, where we can see that there is a similar behavior of the concentration over time to the <clears throat> to the qPCR intensity to the intensity of the fluorescence in the qPCR test. Uh, here we can see this in the S1 and S2 single stranded DNA and the S1 and the double stranded DNA, which are the graphs in blue. As the eight simulations were performed. Uh, <clears throat> the re total reaction time were done at approximately 20 minutes. Uh, and this table is a summary of the results of the um, of the simulations. <clears throat> um, a log transformation of these concentrations were applied to all simulations, and the slope of the exponential part, uh, a linear part after the transformation, is calculated. Uh, this slope indicates <clears throat> how fast the reactions are are being performed. Uh, the greater the slope, the faster the faster the reactions are. Uh, in conclusion, this methodology this methodology implemented in Comsol uh, is capable of capturing the thermofluidic as the thermofluidic the thermofluidic influence on the reaction kinetics and helps and helps us to find the best parameters that can <clears throat> to work with and can be applied to other geometries or systems. <clears throat> uh, the main reason to build this simulated device is the short period of time that, <clears throat> that the reactions take. Uh, as we can see in the graph, at approximately 20 minutes, the total the reaction stops. Um, some questions? Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Question? Um, uh, how much time does it take a uh, normal PCR reaction to take? Um, the traditional PCR devices takes um, 30 minutes to perform the reactions or more time. So your system compared with the commercial ones, how much time saves? <laughs> Compared to some of the commercial ones, uh, it performs the reactions a little bit faster, but <clears throat> but more to, but more data is needed to find a a better a better set of parameters to <clears throat> to make even faster than this the simulations. Um, as we can see before in the in the temperature distribution, where we can see that, uh, can we hide uh, this part? Uh, as so you can see here, the, this part is the extension zone. This, uh, pardon, the, the natural zone, the extension zone, and the milling zone. And we have a counterclockwise motion this affects uh, the system the, the system because it's not the um, ideal way that the PCR could be performed because when the, the denaturation is caused for to the double stranded DNA then the <clears throat> the part of the fluid is cooled, cooled um, <clears throat> and the primers start to bind to the single stranded DNA, but then they start again to denaturate uh, af before they start to to, ex to extend and generate new copies. Uh, this is a problem which can be solved by increasing the velocity of the fluid by making greater differences uh, of the temperature or looking for another jump. Uh, I also have a question. Can 
UPCR is also a quantitative methodology, right? Yes. So with this methodology, you could uh, apply with a quantification of the presence of some quantity group. Uh, and yes. Basically, with RNA, the quantification of RNA that to convert in DNA. Uh, yes, I understand. Uh, reverse transcriptase PCR can be also performed in this kind of devices and a real-time quantitative measure can be performed because we are talking about talking about <clears throat> a capillary glass tube and <clears throat> um, it, it and <clears throat> it, 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 it lets uh, <clears throat> it, and it is transparent or it is transparent. Um, because of this, we can implement um, some of the methodologies done in the QPCR and putting a, I don't know, a CCD camera and the source of fluorescent, uh, a, source, a source of light to <coughs> start uh, <coughs> a, a start measuring in real time how, how much amplifications are being done. Um, over time, uh, but here we need to talk about time, not cycles, because uh, <clears throat> all over all the time, um, there the three steps of the PCR are performed in the same time. And I have another question. You could modify these parameters also the time that is spent in each part of the uh, the, uh, the time, time that the, every because every every PCR test is different, the optimization, depending on the, the biological sample that you are. Uh, yes, depending on the um, biological samples that you have, uh, some modifications of the PCR kinetics model can be done, or if we know that some temperatures are really important to the process of amplification, we can we can modify as well. We, we can modify the radi the radius of the capillar, or even <clears throat> implementing other geometries. But yes, it can be adapted and be used to find the optimal parameters to work with the um, with the sample of interest or with the problem of interest. Okay. Uh, another question, someone. No questions? More questions? No more questions. Well, uh, thank you, Luis. I don't have questions. I don't have questions. Uh, let's um, give a round of applause to the speaker, Luis. Thanks, Luis. Thank you. Luis. Thank you. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Let's go uh, to the last speaker uh, of, the, of this session. Uh, the speaker is Leslie Atsuri. Is that right? No. It's, Atsuri? No, it's Vanya. Ah, excuse me. Uh, Vanya Alices Ortiz Jessica. That's, That's right. right. Do you need uh, time to prepare your presentation? No, just uh, share the presentation here in the in the room. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you can, you can begin when, when you want. Um, you can see my my window. Uh, no yet. But I think I have to wait. No. I think your machine is trying to show the presentation, but. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I can see. Well, uh, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vania Alice Ortiz-Escas, and I'm from a uh, Polytechnic. Um, I was a student in Upita, and I want to uh, talk about the this training with a neurofeedback system for the control of a uh, drug using the electroencephalography signals. Um, we are a team of six persons and uh, six people. We have three teammates and three supervisors, as you can see in my uh, window. I want to talk about uh, that. What is attention? Attention is the ability that people have to discern between different stimulus that our cells uh, have uh, a stimulus. And we focus on one in the specific for the in sustaining attention, or it could be in several, like in the value attention. Attention has three types of, now six, six types of attention. Uh, as you can see, there are the most important. But in this presentation, we're going to talk about mainly about the sustaining attention. Or, <laughs> As I mentioned before, I use the electroencephalography technique. That is the, the technique that allows to record the uh, activity in the cortex. And in this uh, occasion, we use uh, the forehead area. We collocate uh, four electrodes in the FP1, F2, F3, and F4 to to record the signals that are focused on the attention or the managed activities. Uh, for that, the, the theta and beta waves are the most important in this area. And just for the references, we use the International 1020 system for collocate these electrodes. Another thing we have to Think, think is that uh, in nowadays <laughs> we know that video games are reality, uh, virtual uh, virtual reality have different effects that uh, make us have a different type of attention. Sometimes uh, video games are used for a good uh, control in in the reaction or the time for paying attention in some. A kinds of things, uh, activities, but uh, well, every every kind of uh, activity have a different effect. If it's uh, with an object in in three dimension, and we have a different feedback. That is the the main point of this this type of activities that we are going to show you. Our neural feedback is uh, contains three main passes. The first is the stimulus that is a uh, get it with the drone and his displacement or uh, his move in, in a static form. For that, uh, we use an acquisition system that uh, allows to have that analog uh, signals that capture for our brains. <laughs> and digitalize it with the, the microcontroller. We use an ESP32 microcontroller that allows to have a, a good communication between three points importance. The first one is uh, with a cell phone that have an app where we have a backup of all of these analogical brainwaves. And the other one 
is to communicate at a laptop that uh, allows to make all the digital filters uh, have the, the coefficient attention and finally uh, send the, all the wrong commands to, to the wrong uh, uh, something really important is that we use the Bluetooth communication to to have the backup, and we use the Wi-Fi communication with the laptop to send the the commands to the drone. But <laughs> to communicate the 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 EGT system, system to the laptop, we use the serial communication. So we have a uh, really different antis communication between those, and we have a protocol to have uh, the minimal error between all of the three elements. Well, this is our neurofeedback system in just the, the case. Uh, we use four channels. For each channel, we uh, built a prime uh, circuit like this one, and we supply for three batteries of nine volts. In it, for circuit, we have a six main stage. The first one is an impedance couples that are, well, actually are three impedance couples that are in between all of these uh, uh, stage <laughs> that allows to eliminate, el eliminate all of the noise uh, between the components. But the first uh, filter is the instrumentation amplifier that allows to, to amplify <laughs> the, the signal to uh, 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 micro volts uh, with a uh, 100 gain. After that, we have a low pass filter and a high pass filter that allows to select the frequencies between one. 0.1 hertz to 40 hertz. Then we have um, a 20 filter that allows to uh, eliminate that uh, frequency. And we have a, a last inventory of amplifier that allows to have a potential that uh, could be between 1 to, to 10 of the gain. And the last uh, part is the inver inverting other well that the signal of all of these we add a uh, 1.5 volts to uh, adapt to the microcontroller. The microcontroller is uh, finally connected in this part, and for this uh, system, all just uh, use one to communicate the other three elements uh, in a portable way. The controller that, as I mentioned before, is that ESP32, uh, no, no like a uh, 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 controller that could be promoted in Arduino. But the, the main characteristic is that have a, a processing speed uh, very good. For, for this kind of uh, analysis, uh, we have the enough inputs analog to to digitalize all of the, the channels in just one communication. Uh, and another thing is the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth communication that we have used in the same time in all of the, the time, uh, all of the, the moments. Using this, this neural feedback. Um, <laughs> in talking about the digital part, we have a first a chibi chip filter, uh, the type one, that allows to eliminate any kind of uh, noise that could be possible uh, interfering the, the signals between the communications, but then we get the potential, the power spectral uh, density using a modified coherence uh, functions that allows to have uh, 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 have a number of, of quality the, the frequencies between every 
brain wave. And we use um, specifically the area under the curve uh, in the van of the beta brain waves and the theta. There are uh, these two, two peaks. For making the attention coefficient, we we use the uh, uh, a divided uh, uh, a coefficient that is the this area the, the beta area between the, the theta area and we have the result. Uh, we saw that in our volunteers when they have a, a attention, uh, they grow of the the attention coefficient uh, of the the one point. But when they lose that attention, they uh, are under the, the, the one point. So we decided that our threshold is in, in one. <laughs> uh, yeah, even we, we decided all of this, we made an experiment with uh, 11 volunteers that allows to 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 think if, if all of this is functional or not. Uh, for that, we sit uh, our volunteers in front of the doors, the drone, uh, while the drone was uh, moving or the, have a displacement in a kind of figure. We have 16 figures that we uh, program to the drone to do uh, in all the time the session, the session, each session was about 15 minutes. <laughs> we followed the, 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 the volunteers as, as their progress in eight sessions. So uh, for each session, we select all two of the figures and we were increasing the difficult to I have that attention. The volunteer have the activity to select which of uh, figure are uh, making the drum. It could be randomly. So uh, the point for pay attention in the activity, they have to select uh, in the case of the first session, uh, if it's a triangle or a square. For that, we have uh, many results. Uh, firstly, I want to tell about the, the the average of the attention time or in attention time that we we found in our volunteers. In the first session, we can see that uh, the average is more or less in eight seconds per for for attention and a, a moment attention. But <laughs> it could be more or less in all of the, all the volunteers. But how the sessions were happening, we see that we saw that uh, this average was increasing in the attention time. In the other hand, we have the attention time where in the first session was uh, about six seconds, but how in uh, session for uh, happening for the final session uh, we reduce that that average of time and we <laughs> could think that uh, this kind of activities helps to the volunteers to to incre improve their their attention time yeah. <clears throat> mainly the, the sustaining attention After that, we have that uh, this conversation uh, with the maximum of sustaining attention. For that, we have the maximum between all of the volunteers in just one session. As the session were happening, we see that uh, this maximum were decreasing. Mm, apparently, uh, that's not a good idea. But we we found that uh, the the maximum is not decreasing. Uh, even the the all of the volunteers are 
happening uh, are ha having uh, uh, neutral or a normalization between their their attention. In the other hand, we have the inattention time that was increasing, but in, in the average, they uh, maintain it in the same point, more or less. Then we have a uh, overall uh, analysis with all the total time of attention or inattention, and we compare this uh, in the main wave that in the first session we have. Um, uh, Sorry, Maria, to be loose. Uh, OK, we have a uh, more or less 50 50, but uh, for the final session, we we realized that we have an incre uh, increasing of their attention in the total attention from the 50 minutes. They grow up to to six minutes in total. So the inattention in time was decreasing uh, just for three minutes, more or less. Um, and that's all for my presentation. And um, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Vanya and Alice. Uh, yeah. Are there questions? No? No, we don't have questions here. Okay. Okay. I have a question, Vanya. I have a question, Vanya. Uh, actually, I have. Uh, I have more one, more more one, uh, one question. Um, okay. The first uh, question. Uh, why did you use a sixty uh, band reject filter? Consider that that uh, that component is out of the band of interest. Well, actually, uh, between the, all the components, it could be a prior this frequency. So we decide to. To use to uh -huh. eliminate in case of uh, it, it it appears. Uh, in fact, the approximately between all the the components, this frequency could happen. So, what's a good idea to to have it? Okay. Uh, so you really think that the. Uh, uh, the band reject filters uh, of 60 hertz is necessary. Yes. Um, well, um, I'm not sure about that, but uh, we'll uh, <laughs> let's go to the next uh, question. Uh, uh, why did you sell like a Cheviche filter? Is there all um, kind of uh, filters? Yes, we we see the we saw that uh, the EG signals that we digitalize uh, have some noisy, as <laughs> uh, and some noisy. So we made a digital filter to uh, make sure that the the frequency that we are uh, analyzing are the frequency that we want to, to analyze. So uh, that's the reason for what we we use actually check one. We uh, compare with uh, the butterfly filter, chevy shape two, and uh, all of that kind of filters. But we we see that the chevy shape one was the the best uh, with the result and um, more because uh, butterfly filter that is the the most uh, similar filter uh, have a, a change in this part of the filter but with the chevy chef only have uh, this uh, like uh, mini peaks <laughs> but 
uh, as we don't have to use nothing for here, we just uh, select the Chevy Chip one. Okay, uh, uh, the last uh, questions. Uh, did you compare the attention coefficients between you uh, uh, value obtained uh, against uh, other obtained by other authors? Um, not uh, closely because we we designed this uh, coefficient attention between all of the the area, but uh, some of uh, articles that I read before uh, use a similar uh, coefficient using the the relation between beta and theta. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, You're uh, are, are there uh, questions? No? No? Okay. No. Okay. Well, uh, well, before uh, finish this session, uh, I invite like you to show session, all the, uh, the sessions all of this the Congress on the YouTube website. YouTube website later. Uh, and thank you to all of you uh, for you attending the sessions. sessions. We'll see you tomorrow in the we'll BC Bio Two sessions in room two. Bio Two sessions in room two. Uh, at the same time, uh, at the same time, more o'clock yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Dr. Luis. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.